my role here is to to take you a little bit through uh, PropTech and through what's going on there. I I've been instructed not to go too deep into <laughs> any of the parallels because because a lot of people here are going to speak on on the different subjects. Um, so, yeah. But um, I would like to start with uh, with a bit of a story about air quality and the importance of that as well. Because um, as I, they said, I'm um, I've been working with uh, law for many years, but I also um worked in WeWork for, for many years. And when we started new WeWork offices all over the world, uh, there was one demand that was really high, and that was the air quality in the buildings. Because the business model of WeWork was to have a lot of people in the co-working space sitting closely together uh, pre, uh, pre-COVID. Uh, and what they found, the researchers found, was that people are willing to sit pretty tightly if the air quality is is good and if you can measure it and if you can do uh, things to to control it but if it's poor it's it's um, it's uh, Im- impossible to get people to sit in this uh, kind of manner so when we established the offices in in Oslo in Sjøvommen and in in Akir in Nationaltheatret uh, or the we work demands for the air quality were say that the landlord wanted 5 then they wanted 25 and they can uh, see why we would spend 25 million <laughs> on a completely new air air quality system for the building but the, they didn't really get the point that that was kind of the one of the key factors for for we to 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 operate their business model so um, i think uh, air quality will have a significantly uh, increased importance um, going going forward so I, I called the, the presentation PropTech 3.0. That's kind of a PropTech reference to, to the report from, from Andrew, Andrew Baum, an Oxford professor, who um, made kind of the first overview of, of PropTech. And, and I'm trying to give you a little bit of what's going on in PropTech uh, these, uh, these days. Um, so I will speak a little bit about the kind of the innovation side of real estate. Of course, PropTech, as you know it, with air things, with the smart building technology, that's, that's one thing. But uh, on the other hand, you have uh, also what I believe, truly believe is PropTech is, is innovation in finance and transactions and, and, and the whole things with, with, the, uh, with the sharing economy and everything's going on with, with that. So you take existing buildings, for example, and you use a completely different model. So for me, PropTech is uh, not only kind of the tech uh, and, and, and the sensors and, and uh, those uh, sides, but it's the innovation in, in real estate. And I will, at the end, give you a little bit of insights on, on WeWork and uh, give you some secrets from the PropTech side of it. Because everyone or a lot of people have heard about kind of the failed IPO, the whole uh, bubble going out. Perhaps watched a documentary on, on NRK, which has been about WeWork uh, now. But but uh, there's a hidden side of it, and that's kind of the, the PropTech side. And that's uh, a very inter- interesting take on, on, uh, on this uh, subject. But uh, if you see what's the status of PropTech today, then um, you see uh, it's an exponential growth. And, and uh, in PropTech, there's a lot more focus on it. And a really key point to take away is what Axel said, is that a lot of people come from the oil and gas industry into to real estate. And I had a friend working with pipeline engineering lost his job in the oil dip in 2016 and then started working in construction in real estate, uh, planning buildings. And he was shocked on how backward this was because they were out there pl- planning these pipelines in the North Sea with uh, super advanced technology. Uh, and then we really they came to the, the building site and they had things on, on paper. And uh, a lot of these people have been dr- driven into the real estate uh, industry the last five years. Uh, so you see a lot of the innovation coming out of real estate is actually from the oil and gas industry. And what Axel said is that it's oil and gas industry, yes, but it's kind of a tech industry around what's going on uh, with oil and gas. And, and those people have been tremendously important for, for Norway, especially when they chose to, to go into to real estate. And you see a lot of uh, traditional real estate companies now investing in PropTech, but you also see a lot of international venture capital coming into Norway. And, and um, 
we are uh, discussing this and we have been been um, uh, approached uh, in my role in PropTech Norway, which is an association for, for PropTech, which we also run. And we are approached all the time by these international venture capital funds. And this was this is new because uh, five years ago, there was impossible to get venture capital in, in Norway uh, to the to the prop tech industry, and there's some, so a few ones leading the way. I think SpaceMaker Autodesk deal uh, of three billion NOC was uh, kind of an eye opener for many people, and also AirThings going public, uh, it's a big company doing doing well. I think these uh, moves will will uh, help spark the ecosystem for for others. But one thing I, I really uh, see when I, I speak with all these startups that we we know, uh, of course, it doesn't re- it doesn't really is, is affect everyone. But but you still see that most of the innovation comes from the outsiders, like people breaking out of the real estate companies and then innovating. And what does that say about the real estate industry in Norway? Why doesn't any of these companies? come out of the real estate companies. And when I bring out uh, Netflix as an example, they come from outside the movie industry and disrupt the whole industry. Or you take Uber comes from outside the taxi industry and disrupts the industry. And Spacemaker, Horvath was the architect uh, at Link and, and working with that. And then he broke out, made Spacemaker. But, and I don't really know this, uh, of course, but why doesn't uh, this product come out of Link Architects? Why don't... Uh, uh, why don't uh, one of the largest real estate companies in Norway have all these uh, startups in their department? Because real estate companies, they have the competency, they have the money, they have uh, uh, the willingness to to innovate, but they it's something uh, really hindering the companies from from innovating themselves, and that's something the real estate industry should look into themselves. Uh, and I think also there's a lot of more disruption coming. And, and this is the Gartner's hype curve. It's about uh, the hype of new products. Take blockchain, for example. Everyone talks about it for a while. People try it out. It doesn't really uh, work that well or it doesn't really have a practical impact. It really flattens out and then suddenly it matures. And this happened with, for example, VR technology. It was really like a bus and then... It, People uh, really didn't know what to do with it. And now it's starting to be in use. Like if you go to your ro- local real estate broker, he will have a VR simulation of, of an apartment you're going to visit. And this was kind of futuristic only two or three years ago. Uh, and uh, you see uh, air things, for example, are it's a product that people can actually use today. So, so they are on that scale. But... If you see that <laughs> that kind of uh, curve, it doesn't really matter all the different kind of technologies, but a lot of them are on the upside or downside of the hype curve. So th- that that means that a lot of this technology will, some of it will fall away, but a lot of it will will um, be more relevant the coming years. And if you take, if you say that. Um, 20% of the world's venture capital is put into <laughs> all these technologies coming in this wave. And uh, just VR is the only kind of output uh, that really has been used practical today. I think you can see that a lot of change is going to happen just from, from that. And uh, in Norway as well, we have um, uh, a bigger focus on, on uh, digital economy. And this is something for everyone here because... Um, yeah, they are going to make data, uh, information data free uh, from Kartverke and from from the other uh, suppliers, and that's a small thing. But but there's a big focus on how to innovate in real estate and digitalize in real estate. And Kommunal Departementet are now setting down a, um, a board uh, with people from the real estate industry to uh, look at digital economy and, and real estate. And uh, that's something that people here should also be part of because they, of course, then invite the largest real estate companies. I didn't see any prop tech companies on that uh, board. So AirThings, for example, would be a good good candidate for that or, or the larger ones that could really give some advice to, to the government on um, on how to digitalize real estate. But for today's topic, we're go- going to just to go through the kind of the three uh, main areas of PropTech because everyone asks, what is PropTech then? Well, for me, it's 
kind of these, I think Andrew Baum's uh, drawing, this is from Oxford University. I think this is one of the, one of the um, ones that's really stands there. A lot of people have tried different models, but I think it's, PropTech is smart real estate, uh, which we will go into, but uh, but like um, uh, air things or, or sensors or other things with real estate. And then you have the sharing economy, which we'll, we'll also go into, but taking existing buildings, using new business models to use them better. And then you have everything with real estate fintech, um, which is uh, transaction technology, new financing technology. And, and all of this technology could be used for industry or it could use be in oil and gas, but it also affects real estate. And uh, that's why it's a part of uh, real estate um, or prop tech. Uh, there you can see uh, kind of the definition and I, I'm sticking to kind of the Andrew Baum definition of prop tech. There's many ways to look at it, but uh, but there's uh, these kind of fields are, are where I uh, see the most uh, innovation happening. Uh, and of course, uh, you can also um, discuss the effects of uh, of COVID on, on this. And um, when COVID hit, a lot of people uh, thought that everything would really change and there's going to be a lot going on. But what uh, Tommy and Practice PropTech have brought up on their podcast a couple of times is that it's really crazy to see that when COVID hit, uh, the energy consumption in the buildings without people was about the same as it was before with people. And that's, that's something about the steering systems for for the for the buildings, and and people have become more aware of this in PropTech. Of course, uh, we could talk a lot about the future of work um, after prop uh, after COVID, but. But um, it's yet to see what kind of long-term effects it will have on the market. But one thing I, I can say is that it's become more, everyone in, in, in uh, business has become more uh, digital. Uh, I used to uh, see the partners in the, in the law firm, for example, asking like, where's the video equipment? I need to talk to someone and I need to go to the meeting room department and you have to set up the video equipment. And <laughs> the same partners a year later um, could just go to Teams on their phone. And I think this uh, shift in digital mindset will have something to say with, when all the decision makers are more, more digital in such a short time. I think that will have something to say. Um, and I will just briefly go through the, the three areas and then I will give you a few insights on, on WeWork and, and the research from, from that time. Uh, but uh, the smart buildings and smart cities are uh, mostly based on sustainability. And I'm sitting in, the, in a jury to find like the, uh, Europe's best prop tech company uh, for the European prop tech house, uh, which was uh, on Tuesday this week. Um, uh, and all of these companies, 10 top companies, they could be at the environmental conference, I thought, because everyone was speaking about the environment and, and, uh, and sustainability and, and a little bit about the product and a lot about sustainability. And the shift has been so large in, in that sense. 10 years ago, when I worked with real estate transactions, then no one really, or people were, they liked the build, buildings being green, but it wasn't really a big requirement. Now it's, and I haven't seen any new development projects or, or transactions where, where sustainability hasn't come up. And uh, all the property companies are really uh, looking into how to, to make uh, their business more sustainable. And that's one thing, but with the new EU taxonomy that's coming now, uh, a lot of the real estate owners are actually need to figure out the numbers and need to document that their buildings are sustainable, uh, which gives a big opportunity for, for companies that are working in this field. But it also means that a, a prop tech company cannot just say that they're sustainable without any documentations because uh, the real estate industry are more uh, concerned with documenting this. So uh, I think it's going to be harder to greenwash both the real estate portfolio, but also the prop tech companies cannot really say that we are green because we work in some kind of mobility thing. And it's it, like, you have to have uh, something uh, concrete on that. But I think that's the key focus. And, and um, all of these uh, different types of technologies are, are uh, um, part for themselves. But one, one thing I personally think is that when you see so many nice and good tech innovations in your home and in your private life, 
uh, people are going to be reluctant to accept uh, less at their workplace going forward. Uh, and I think that will have a lot to say. When If you use Facebook at private and you use uh, Google Home and you have all this uh, kind of convenience at home and then you come to the office and you have a really bad uh, communication platform at your workplace and you have uh, yeah, a very uh, not a seamless experience, I think that's going to... Uh, that people get more technology at home will, will uh, also push people to do this in, in more business uh, life. And also uh, smart cities, it's kind of a buzzword, but but there's something very interesting about uh, how to utilize urban tech and uh, like uh, technology or data uh, on movement and traction to, to, uh, to uh, figure out how to plan cities better. Um, and this is a, a science field in itself. And But there's also an anecdotal uh, point there because Google, uh, they said that we are going into real estate development now, Sidewalk Labs, and they actually said this, and this is the kind of the quote they said, that we have the smartest people in the world, we have a lot of money, we have the tech, like the only thing we need to learn is how to develop real estate, and then we can be a real estate developer also. Uh, and how hard could that be? And they said that as a, like a, as a joke, and, and of course, they wouldn't think that real estate is more harder than the things that they're actually doing in Google. Uh, but the whole Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto actually stopped now because of uh, the neighbors complaining. People didn't want to be uh, super, uh, to, to them to watch over them. There were privacy issues. There were a lot of issues. And the whole Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto has now really shrunk into to, uh, less. So, so everyone's talking about these big companies coming into real estate, but... Yeah, uh, we'll uh, we'll see how how the smart city programs really goes. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, this uh, sides to construction tech as well, how to to build and set up um, the buildings. Um, what I also found interesting is that in the second area, uh, real estate fintech, uh, you have uh, also a lot of innovation going on, and that's this is in finance tech, so it doesn't really ha affect uh, have anything to do with real estate in in itself. But on the other hand, it, it kind of uh, affects real estate because if you trade differently, if you lend money differently, it's going to be a different kind of uh, ball game. Um, so uh, all these uh, type of infotech data companies and, and new lenders are, are affecting the market. And you have um, a lot of companies coming into prop tech, selling data or selling insights uh, that could uh, help in, in transactions and in, in uh, real estate development itself. Um, you see uh, everyone from uh, Dutch uh, Air DNA, they just take uh, information from Airbnb and, and just make a product that lets people know where it's most popular to live in a city. And we're kind of general, but, but this is that something easy about how you can utilize info um, and all these Norwegian uh, companies doing mapping services as well. There's also a lot of technology going into kind of residential sales and loans and all of that. And uh, it's pretty interesting because um, if you are uh, if you are um, uh, used to using robots doing valuations, you are used to doing trading apartments in a much easier digital way. This will of of course affect how you, you use commercial real estate uh, in itself. And one of the things a lot of people asked about WeWork didn't really end up like that. But uh, if all the buildings are run by kind of these co-working operators uh, that could um, house 200 people in one floor and 500 in another floor, do you really then need kind of the real estate brokers or will it disrupt that whole industry? Because uh, a big uh, company can just go into to the site of uh, one of these uh, big uh, co-working providers, office providers, and, and get the space they need without the broker. This didn't really uh, end up that way, but um, but it's uh, interesting to see how it. Uh, this also disrupts how we we run a real estate industry, and we also see the mortgage tech. Uh, so much innovation in fintech, yeah, and uh, fin the fintech companies are of course struggling with regulatory issues because uh, it's hard to. 
to uh, get around kind of the rules and, and the law and the different kind of uh, permits you need. But um, there's so much innovation, and this uh, of course goes on in London, but uh, and uh, the main capitals, but also coming here. You see crowdfunding, for example, uh, Cameo and, and these companies are, are doing very well in Norway. Um, and of course, a big uh, buzzword as well is, is blockchain. Uh, I, this could be a day in itself to, to, to discuss, but it's uh, also worth noting that um, and that smart contracts and, and, uh, and uh, other types of uh, um, systems that could uh, uh, use uh, make you have more trust in in the, the counterparty will will could affect us, but this has been a big discussion since 2016-17, and uh, it's really hasn't really been too much uh, effect uh, effect on the real estate industry for today. But uh, this is kind of a long uh, story as well, so uh, we can uh, I'm happily to discuss that. Um, after um, and then you have the sharing economy uh, and what I, how, why I include this is because you take existing space like a co-working space and then or you can have Airbnb or you can use any of these other type of flex space doing uh, different kind of models so you take some a product that's already there and you put more people into it and you utilize it um, in a different and, and better way and and that is um, kind of uh, innovation in real estate itself because you innovate the business model. So uh, any at any given time, uh, a building will have about in Europe during working hours will have a fifty or sixty percent occupancy on the desks. Uh, so um, if you can uh, utilize that in a better way, of course that will be a big innovation in. Uh, in real estate, and that's what Airbnb does. They they have uh, have uh, empty apartments. You are away. The apartment is empty. Then you utilize it. Then you save energy and you uh, you um, uh, create kind of a new market where nothing really is. Like if you take a big office building and it's all empty during the whole weekend, could you use it for something? And some companies are tackling this this issues, but I think that's also worth mentioning in um, in uh, the sense of innovation in real estate that taking shorter contracts making new uh, products available for new companies will will also be very important for for real estate i think flex office will be larger uh, going forward and uh, not Kind of the traditional co-working space where you just grab a seat and uh, drink a free beer with with your colleagues, but but that the the larger providers can provide more space for twenty people uh, or fifty people or two hundred people, and you give the business proposal to to a company saying that you're two hundred people today, but um, if you're one hundred and fifty next month, uh, then you'll pay for one hundred and fifty. So you pay per person, and you use space as a service. And um, I think COVID has really taught us that space is kind of a service. It's not a given. You don't have to have an office. You should have an office. I think everyone wants to go to some, somewhere, but space is more of a service. It's not something that every single company needs for every single employee. That's kind of the learnings there. And uh, at the end there, uh, I, I'll just uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about my time in WeWork and kind of the unknown prop tech story. Is it time? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I started in WeWork uh, in 2019 when everything was uh, going upwards and, and it was worth, I think, $47 billion. Uh, and we were launching in, Euro in Northern Europe and, and um, flew down to Berlin every Monday, starting up new offices. And it was kind of a crazy ride. The first first day, this is true, we flew 6,000 people to Los Angeles and it was a party for one week uh, uh, with 6,000 people from all over the world uh, with Red Hot Chili Peppers playing and Will Smith was the conference here and, and there was like, uh, they rented the whole uh, theme park, uh, Universal Studios for only us with free drinks everywhere and it was like... I, then I thought something uh, I don't I don't know who's paying for this <laughs> and uh, I will probably not collect my pension from this company but uh, but it's uh, gonna be a fun fun ride until until something happens and 
And uh, it was like kind of a hyper growth period when I I worked there. When you started, uh, we were negotiating 40, 50 com- uh, deals every uh, every week. This is true. Like we try- there was always these new targets. Like you open thousand desks, and next week it was like the target is three thousand, and then the target is ten thousand. It was uh, crazy because they needed to burn the money to to own the market, and it's kind of a Side story with this theory called blitz scaling that Airbnb and LinkedIn and other companies have done successfully and, and that we work try to do. Like you scale so fast that you take over the whole market and then at a tipping point you will kind of choose when to be, be profitable. But that's, that's, to do that you need a lot of cash to, to burn for a long, long period of time. So the, they tried to go public in, in August 2020 and it uh, completely crashed and then SoftBank t- took over the whole company. Uh, and uh, now I've turned it around, I cut a lot of costs, and now it's going public this October for, I think, $10 billion. Uh, so it's kind of a long way from 47, but still they managed to save kind of the core core business, and, and um, that's going uh, on. But, and the boss, Adam Neumann, is uh, gone. He got $3 billion and and uh, a severage package to go out of the board of directors. So he is uh, doing pretty well himself. But uh, so, so, but uh, when you watch some of the documentaries about this, it's all about things being... Um, it's, it's about uh, the Adam Neumann and everything going around the CEO and, and the company and the parties and that kind of thing. But what I think is that there's a lot of change coming, a lot of people going to cities. And uh, I think uh, uh, some of the challenges that all the businesses face, like you see the third one, forecasting. 60, PVC, they found out that 61% of all directors they don't know how to uh, calculate um, the costs uh, for for pay, um, uh, lending payments for for their employees uh, three years from now and what does that mean well 61 percent of the CEOs don't know how many people they're going to be in three years and then they take a lease for 10 years and say that oh let's take a chance we're this amount of people we're probably going to be exactly the same for 10 years so let's uh, seal this deal and, and have this huge building. And um, I think the the value proposal for more flexibility is uh, very interesting. And to take these kind of office spaces that's empty and fill them with people. This is in, in Paris uh, and in the WeWork station. But the point is that these people look like a group of friends uh, and these are just people there's this is in Champs-Élysées and all the people work in different banks and and law firms and uh, this is pre-covid uh, <laughs> get a little stressed to look at the picture but uh, uh, but um, uh, the point is that these people are choosing this place to to hang out and that uh, after work uh, with people that work in the same building and that creates kind of a, a bond to that that building. So, so there's a lot of things going on in the flex office there. Um, but my end point, I will go through this last thing very shortly, but this is very interesting to me because I thought that, okay, I will never collect my pension from this company. But what, what do they have really? They have 1,000 people working with uh, research, data scientists working with research on how to use build and operate buildings. And, and that's crazy. Like the second largest company have kind of, 10 doing this and and uh, internally then what was the business what was the kind of idea okay you can open a lot of co-working spaces but what if you had the largest data set in the world on how to build operate and use buildings facebook is valuable because they have the largest data set on how you act online what if you have the same data set on how you act in real life uh, at, the, at the office and you can sell that to the largest asset class in the world the real estate industry and that was very, very, very interesting to, to me to uh, see because the, you, you say that the future will be awesome if you can handle all the insights. And, and what we started with was the learning experience that, okay, we work as a tech, tech uh, company with a lot of young people. Let's put sensors everywhere and then that we have data on everything and then it's going to be awesome. But the point being that it didn't really work because you didn't have people to look at the insights. So why do you need the information on where everyone is at all times in the building if you don't 
you can handle insights if you don't have people to to look into it. It's it's pointless. Uh, and then they took away all the sensors, and then they started new uh, research projects on everything uh, in smaller groups. So they say, okay, let's find out like something more specific, like how um, how can we uh, measure occupancy in the building? How many people will be in the building um, going forward? Or how how do people actually use one specific building? And that's um, was very interesting. And uh, they set down these small task forces of people, and they found, took okay, we have five hundred thousand people. Let's find out how uh, internal staircases affect uh, friendship levels in the buildings. And it actually affects it a lot. Um, so uh, they asked um, tens of thousands of people, like, what kind of break areas do you like? And they say that, oh, I want a lounge and I want uh, newspapers and I want a TV. And then they tracked people with uh, with uh, heat-seeking cameras in certain locations. And they saw that most people take all their breaks in the coffee area. And then they found out that this is true and statistically significant. And they, they build this kind of kitchen areas and there's no kitchen supplies there it just looks like a kitchen and you naturally just go there and grab your coffee and i really didn't think about it before i saw the research but it's like uh, and people feel more efficient like they you don't sit down in the lounge chair in the middle of your office you, you just go to the office there and you have a long break but you have the the coffee there and same with the vertical staircases was super important because it increased the friendship levels in the buildings uh yeah and then you see um see uh, how uh, and uh, how you um, kind of get that and they had also uh, as the last example i can show that they asked a lot of people what, what kind of colors do you like in the buildings and uh, they said that well i like blue i like green uh, that's kind of our favorite colors and they tried to paint in these bright colors and then they t put brain scanners on people and they show them simulations of different reworks and then they show that this yellow color <laughs> is actually the favorite color, but no one would say that that's my favorite color. Um, but it was that what made their brain or react uh, the least and made them more, more relaxed. And the point with all of these uh, things is this, and I think that's super important, that they had experiences uh, in the building, experiences happen, you got the data, then you made predictions with it, and then you made new experiences, and then it continued, so it didn't really end there. Then you said, okay, we made these kitchen islands because of our research on that, but this did it work? Did it work, like, how does it work culturally? How does it work in different kind of jurisdictions? Get the data, make new predictions, and then there's a cycle going on, and if you have 1,000 data scientists doing that, then you can find out a lot of interesting things. And uh, this was uh, too bad that they kind of hit their, uh, their brakes there, but I think uh, this is kind of a learning for, for a lot of companies. So, But I, I reached my, my time there, so I will uh, say goodbye and let's yeah, talk in the break.